Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the solid principles, which are a set of five design principles originally created for object-oriented programming. We'll discuss whether these principles can be applied to a functional code base or whether functional programming um, needs its own set of design principles. My name's Georgina, and I'm a software developer. And most of my um, experience has been um, in object-oriented Java development. But at the moment, I am working on a project which comprises of microservices. And some of those services are written in Elixir. When I first started out my career, um, there was a lot to learn. Um, I was using Java and C++, so probably the most object-oriented languages that you can find. And I had to learn how to see the world as objects and how those objects would interact with each other. I also had to learn the syntax of the language so I could bring the solutions to life. And at this early stage, most of my effort was spent just lashing code together, hoping that it would work, getting it working. But over time, I got to grips with the OO way of thinking, and I soon realized that just getting my code to work was not really enough. I needed to take my code further in order to produce um, solutions that could live longer and be easier to maintain and test and for other people to work on. So luckily, I made a career move, and I joined um, a company which was very much invested in teaching their developers some best practices. And the solid principles became an integral part of the developer's um, process. After applying the solid principles to my Java code, I felt I could be proud of my solutions. Um, they were easier to maintain and extend. They were more robust. The same company asked me to learn a functional language. So as a consultant, I could go in um, to different clients and evaluate which paradigm and which languages would be best suited to solve the problems that they were facing. So I decided to learn Elixir. At this point, I had years of experience of uh, systems analysis and problem solving. I could already program in Java. Um, so learning the syntax of Elixir was uh, not very difficult. It wasn't really a barrier. And I quickly got something working. But then I felt I was in the same position as I had been earlier in my career. I had a functional code base which worked, but I felt I needed to take it a step further. And I didn't really know what principles to apply. I wasn't aware of any principles specifically for functional programming languages. So I decided to stick with what I knew and do an experiment and apply the solid principles to a functional code base. So the solid principles are a set of five design principles where each letter stands for a different principle. When applied, they're intended to improve the quality of your software in terms of making it easier to extend, um, less likely to break if you face making some changes. And they're originally devised for object-oriented programming, but I wanted to see if they'd work in the functional landscape. The case study that I've chosen to demonstrate these principles today are um, an Elixir microservice, which forms part of a holiday booking site. The code we'll be looking at concerns customers' search preferences, so they can search for what accommodation that they want to find um, when they're going on holiday. It's an Elixir plug service, and um, the services will interact using HTTP. The booking sites have many search forms like so. When customers log in, um, they can navigate to this tab. They can select what they're looking for in terms of accommodation, press search, and be presented with a list of options. The first time the user logs into the page, there'll be no options pre-selected on the form. But as soon as they've gone on and made a search, we'll save those search preferences so that should they come back, uh, we'll be able to pre-populate the form with the last preferences that they used. So in order to fetch these uh, pre uh, saved preferences, we have a get endpoint in our system. A typical workflow is the user will log in, and they'll go to the search tab. On loading the page, a get request is fired. And under the hood, um, we'll go and do a get um, to the database. And we're using DynamoDB for this example, which is a non-SQL database associated um, in a well, it's available in AWS. But you could use um, any any persistent store. We store our data internally in a map format. 
And then we translate that to some JSON and send it back to the calling client. And that's used then to populate the search form. Having explained how to get the data, we also have to be able to persist the data. So the use case here is that a user would log in, navigate to the form. They would select what they want to search for. And then on pressing search, we'll trigger off a post, which will go ahead um, and start the persistence uh, workflow off. We have to translate our data the other way around this time from the JSON to our internal map so that we can store that in the database. And it will get popped into the DynamoDB. So for the purposes of this talk, just think about the service as um, a CRUD service. So now you have a flavor of the domain, we can get back to our solid principles. The first one is called single responsibility. So the official definition of single responsibility um, from Wikipedia is that every class or module should be responsible for a particular part of the system. So what does that really mean? Well, using this definition on this occasion, let's decide that fetching user preferences is a single part of the system. So we can write an Elixir module that will encapsulate that logic. We have our module here. The first thing we need to do is query the database with the customer ID, which is obtained when the user's logged on. We then need to translate our raw database um, data into an internal struct, and that strips out metadata that DynamoDB returns, which we're not really interested in. And then we transform our raw data, our struct, into some JSON, and then we'll return that back to the calling client. So in a nutshell, we have three steps inside this module. We look up the data from the database, we strip out the metadata, and then we translate that to a JSON response. So is that really single responsibility? Well, those three steps do make up um, fetching user preferences. But let's ask ourselves another question. One way of trying to identify if you're violating the single responsibility principle is to ask yourselves, of the steps within this module, can any of them change independently? For instance, if we decided to change the query to the database, so instead of using the customer ID, we used the customer ID and um, country of origin or something, would that mean our JSON um, response needed changing? Probably not. As long as the data we're getting back is in the same format, all of the downstream steps wouldn't really be affected. So this could mean that we have steps that could diverge and um, change independently, which could lead to a violation of the single responsibility principle. There's a few definitions on Wikipedia of this um, principle. And I um, tend to favor this one from Uncle Bob. And he expresses that the principle um, should mean that a class should only have one reason to change. And in Elixir, we don't have classes. Instead, we have modules. So we could update this definition to be a module only has one reason to change. So as a reminder, we started out with one module containing three steps. So let's apply this updated definition from Uncle Bob and see if our solution suits having each step inside its own module. So we'll start with the functionality which queries the database. We've wrapped that in its own module. And we can already see it's far, far smaller and much more focused. So now we can actually test this independently, and we'll have much more focused tests. If the JSON response changed now, we wouldn't have to touch this at all. It's completely separated. The second step we defined was um, transforming our raw data response into a struct to strip out surplus data we don't need. Now, if we look closely at this module, we're actually just wrapping a library call here. We're using the library XAWS to help us interact with the database. So it's debatable whether this actually needs its own module or whether this could just be merged with the previous module, which looks up the user preferences, because there's not really any business logic in here. But the point is, don't be afraid to break down your systems. And if you find you need to put bits back together again, then that's fine. The last step is transforming to JSON. And it makes sense to have this separate, because it's doing a completely different job 
Um, it's not interacting with the database at all. And we can change this JSON response as we wish without affecting any of the database queries. Our controller now becomes quite thin. It just coordinates the calls between the new modules. And it means the testing of this is easier as well. So if we think back to when we had all of the logic in one controller, if we wanted to test the JSON formatting, we'd need to hit the get endpoint, we'd need to mimic data coming back from the database, we'd then have to translate that into a struct, transform it to JSON, and, and then we could check that the JSON was as expected. And that's an awful lot of setup. So by having these smaller, more focused modules, we can have much more focused tests. And with focused tests come much more focused failures. And that tends to lead to a much quicker resolution. The number of high-level tests can be reduced because there's only, you only need to check that the coordination is happening correctly. Um, and they tend to be more expensive to run and require more setup anyway. So keeping them thin um, is a nice idea. There's always trade-offs. And with every module that exists, there is an overhead. You have to maintain it. Um, you have to make sure it's um, kept up to date. So it is good to make sure that every module you create does warrant its existence. And if you find yourself with a plethora of modules of which some always change together, then it might be a sign that they should actually be merged together. The next principle is the open-close principle. This principle states that you should be able to extend functionality without modifying the source code. That sounds like an oxymoron, like how do you change something if you can't touch the source code? Well, I try to think of it as um, it should be the ability to add new code without changing any of the existing code. So we'll just remind ourselves of our post endpoint. Um, when a user searches for some accommodation, we persist the search preferences into our database so that we don't store any incomplete data, we perform a set of validation rules prior to persisting. We want to check that the customer ID is valid and that the request body has some mandatory fields. We, we must have those fields existing. With our single responsibility principle in mind, we've got the validation rules defined, and each rule is in its own module so that they can be tested independently. <clears throat> we, have, um, we run through all the validation rules, and if everything's good, the request is valid, we'll go ahead and persist our row into our database and return a 201 back to our client. But if something is missing from the request, we want to indicate that um, what the problem was. So we return a 400, and we will give a reason as to why the request has been rejected. And the client can amend their request and try again. So I want to add a new validation rule. Um, to my service. So I'll create a new module which contains the business logic of the new rule, and I'll add that into my with statement so that it's executed as part of the flow. If um, that rule fails, I need to be able to handle that, and I want to tell the client why, so I need to add um, an error case. But wait a minute, the open close principle stated that we should be able to add new code without actually modifying any existing code. And here we're modifying existing code. We've updated the with statement, and we've had to add the error handling in. So we're violating the open close principle. Now, whilst adding a new rule in this example seems quite trivial, in a real production uh, system, you could have tens or hundreds of rules. And having to configure them and test all those permutations might be quite complicated. So as that list of rules grow, we don't want to have to maintain all these different permutations of tests. And also, even for the sunny day scenario, we'd have to make sure our request was set up so that all of the rules ad were adhered to. So it might be more convenient if we instead have a kind of plug-in architecture. That way, in our test environment, for example, we could just plug in one or two rules. And then in production, we could plug in all of the rules. So let's do that. Let's look at our original set of rules. And I think we could say that they generally fall into two categories, those that concern validation of the header and those that contain uh, validation of the body. So if we create a list of header rules and a list of body rules, and we wrap 
each of those lists in an Elixir module. We can then iterate over those lists and traverse the rules. So here, I've got a list of my validation functions. I traverse over those rules, and if any of them fail, I report an error and give a reason why. So now if we were to add a new rule, we'd need to add it to the list, but the surrounding logic, the surrounding code, wouldn't actually need to change. The calling code of this then becomes more simple, because it just needs to kick off the header rules and the body rules, and the details of each of the rules is hidden away at a lower level. <clears throat> so we could say that at this level, we're adhering to open close principle, because it doesn't know whether it's executing one rule or 100 rules. So what needs to change now if we want to add a new validation rule? We would need to add a new module containing the new rule as a function in the list. And if we think of this list as configuration rather than code, we could say that we are adhering to the open close principle because none of our other code in this module needs to change. But there's always trade-offs. And testing's not really become any easier because if we do have 100 rules, uh, we still have to make sure that our test data is adhering to all those rules. And in our test environment, they'll all be injected in, uh, whereas we might just want one or two in to simplify things. So as these rules grow, permutations become more difficult, and maintenance might become an overhead. So it's definitely a step in the right direction to um, narrow down the area of change just to a single list. But one of the other drawbacks here is that there's no contracts in place. So we don't really have any safety in terms of what these functions are going to return. Um, and the surrounding code is expecting that a tuple is returned. So in order to firm up and make this more secure, we could actually use an Elixir behavior. And this allows us to define a contract, a bit like in Java, how you have an interface and you define a contract which that class will need to adhere to. So each module that implements this behavior will need to uh, provide an implementation for the functions defined on that behavior. So we can define one which has um, an is valid function. So this states that any modules that are going to use this behavior must provide their own implementation of the is valid method, which takes a map. And it will return either a tuple containing OK and some data, or a tuple containing error, and then some reasons as to why um, that request has errored. So now we need to update the rules to actually implement our behavior. To do that, we just provide an annotation. And then we provide um, the function that the contract is needing. So when we're using these behaviors, rather than having a list of functions, we can actually now just have a list of modules because we know what um, functionality is available on these modules because they're all um, adhering to the same contract. Then in our code, when we iterate the rules, we can actually safely call the isValid function because we know that that's on the contract. If you forget to provide your implementation, then you will get an exception telling you. So the last step to make this fully configurable would be to move the list of modules from the code into the config files. And this way, we can set up different uh, lists of rules depending on the different runtime environment. So in Elixir, you have a different config file for every environment. So in our test config, we could just provide a couple. Um, but in production, we could provide them all. Then at runtime, we look up in our config what set of rules should be injected in. And that gives us then the flexibility of just using a couple of rules in one environment or when we're running our unit tests, and then all the rules when we're running the real system. So now, to add a new rule, we need to add a new module containing the new business logic for our rule. We need to configure that module name in the relevant list in the config file of the relevant environment. And that's all we needed to do. We've managed to successfully add new rules without touching any existing source code. So we're now adhering to the open-close principle. Again, this might seem overkill for this example. But in real life, where you have rapidly changing business requirements and you might need to demo things quickly and get faster feedback, then having the ability to plug in and out different rules uh, might be a, an advantage. So the next principle is list cost substitution. 
In um, object-oriented languages, we have the concept of classes, and classes can inherit behavior of other classes. So in this example here, we have a report class, and that provides a format method. And then we have a marketing report class, which inherits this behavior, as well as having some behavior of its own. This is the official definition of list cost substitution. And if you haven't come across it before, I wouldn't even try and understand it, because they always write it in a really complicated way. But essentially, it's trying to say, where you have a variable that's of the base type, so in our case, in our example, the report, you should be able to switch in any of the uh, subclass types without having an undesirable effect on your system. So this is probably best demonstrated with a small Java snippet. So here we have a declared a report variable, and that's a marketing report, and we're calling format. List cost substitution is saying we should be able to replace the, format the report type with the marketing report type, and everything should still run. And this works because of the inheritance model. We know that the format method is available on the most generic uh, layer that there is, um, so everything will compile and run. Now, in functional programming, we don't really use inheritance very much, sometimes not at all. But let's see how we can model something similar using Elixir. We have some reporting capabilities in our holiday service. Um, user preferences are sent to our marketing department so that targeting advertising can be sent to our customer base. Additionally, customer preferences are sent to our data warehouse department so that over time we can see historical searches and we can look for trends. So in a nutshell, the raw data in the database is sliced and diced into different views, which are then used to create different reports for different areas around the company. So we're going to use another behavior to help us. We're going to have um, each report module implement this formatter behavior, which has a format to rows function. And that will be uh, the logic which is formatting the raw data, particularly for a specific report. So we can map some modules to this diagram. We have an advertising report module, which implements the formatter behavior. So this means the advertising report must provide a format to rows implementation, which formats the data specifically for the advertising report. We have a historical data warehouse report, and again, that implements the same behavior, and it will provide a diff different uh, logic inside the format to rows specific for this historical report. And then we have a report generator. And this takes the raw data um, and a list of formatters. And it will map over those formatters, formatting the data before dispatching them um, to the various departments. So here, we could actually plug in any module that implements the formatter. Um, and this code will run as expected, because it will have the same contract, it will have a format to rows function available, and it, there'll be no undesirable effects. So we can say that we're adhering to the list cost substitution principle. But you know what real life's like. Our holiday site's really taking off, it's gained a lot of traction, and at the same time, there's a regulatory requirement that's come in, so we need to generate a new report, and it's for legal, and legal are always a bit tricky. Um, they, never, they never want something you've already got. They want something like what you've got, but a bit different. So they state that they need a report that's got the same formatting as the historical data report, but it needs a bit more um, tinkering with. We have to add a disclaimer, a header, and add some colors. OK, so we can create a legal report generator that will take the raw data and a formatter. We've already got a formatter which uh, formats the data as we want. And we can just add in the disclaimer, the headers, and the colors. So let's do that. We'll update our historical data report so that we can reuse the functionality already defined in the format to rows function. And then we can just add these new uh, presentation functions onto it. So when we pass this in now to our legal report generator, we have an implementation for all of the functions it's expecting. We'll format to rows, and then we just added the new disclaimer and the headers and so on. So we can successfully run this without any problems. And we generate our legal report, and legal are happy. But 
What happens if we now send in an advertising formatter to our legal report generator? Our advertising report has a definition for format to rows, but it doesn't have a definition for the disclaimer, adding the he headers and the colors, because they're not actually on the contract. So of course, we'll get an exception happen. And that's an undesirable effect in the system. So now we're breaking the list cost substitution because according to list cost substitution, we should be able to pass in anything that implements the formatter behavior and the system should work as expected. So we need to think a little bit more. We know we want to reuse the formatting that's in historical data report, but we need to do something extra. So rather than updating the existing report, let's create a new one which uses the existing one. So we create a new uh, report which implements the original formatter behavior so that we don't break any contracts. Inside the format to rows function, we're going to delegate out and use our existing data warehouse module so that we can leverage the format to rows functionality that we already have. And then we can go on and add the presentation. And we can hide this behind the format to rows function by just providing some private methods. So now, all of our reports actually adhere to the same interface. So we don't need a special legal generator anymore. We can actually just use the same report generator for all of them. So by wrapping an, an existing formatter, we were able to extend its functionality without actually exposing that to any of the calling clients. So in Elixir, we could say that list cost substitution could be defined as where we have code that expects a behavioral type, make sure that you're using only those functions that are defined on the behavior, so at the most generic level. But why didn't we just update the formatter so that it had these presentation functions on it as well? We saw how this potentially made sense for a historical data report, because sometimes it needed them. But for our advertising report, is actually not relevant. We don't need to add these presentation level methods at all. But if we had updated the behavior, we would have been forced to update all of our formatters because we, they would have needed to adhere to the contract. So in our advertising report, we would have had to have added a disclaimer, add a header, and, and the colors functions, but they wouldn't have really had any work to do. So essentially, we would have just been supplying an um, empty definition. And that's confusing for the developer, because where you see a contract that you need to adhere to, you typically expect that you need to provide a good implementation for those functions and that they're needed. But in this case, they're not. So it's usually a sign that your design is not quite right. Similarly, if we had um, lots and lots of different reports, we wouldn't really want to have to update them all to have these new functions, just because maybe one or two of them actually needed it. So if we had done this, we could say that we'd bloated the behavior in order to satisfy a new requirement. And in turn, that would have um, violated the next solid principle, which is interface segregation. So the interface segregation principle states that clients should not be forced to depend on contracts that they don't actually use. In object-oriented programming, there's different traits you can look out for in the code base which indicate this violation. So typically, it's found in very tall class hierarchies, where maybe methods are spread across different responsibilities, or in things like Java interfaces, where you have lots and lots of um, methods, again, which are spread across different things. So translating this into the world of Elixir, we could look for modules that have many, many functions across different responsibilities, or large behaviors. We already discussed why we thought it wasn't a very good idea to update the formatter behavior to include those presentation level uh, functions. And that was because they're not relevant to all of the implementations. So let's leave the formatter behavior as it was so that we don't break any existing contracts. And instead, let's create a second behavior, which contains the presentation level functions. So having these split now allows us to leave our advertising report alone because it already implements the formatter behavior and it doesn't need the presentation level ones. And we can actually update our historical data format to implement both 
because Elixir lets you implement as many behaviors as you like, as long as you provide a body for all of the functions that are expected. So now, when we generate our reports, we can split it up into two steps. We can run um, the formatting through and dispatch those uh, reports. But if the report needs to be presented as well, we can run that through another step. And the calling code can decide which step is relevant for which report. So this way, we've been able to restrict um, the extra functionality down to only those reports where it's actually relevant. And you'll find that several of the solid principles start to overlap, because by keeping your behavior small and focused, you're typically reinforcing the single responsibility rule as well. So that brings us on to our last solid principle, which is dependency inversion. There was too many words on Wikipedia to put them all on a slide, but I've tried to represent the essence of it here. And it's about keeping your high-level layers separated from your low-level layers in your system. If you remember, we have a get endpoint which fetches user uh, search preferences. Under the hood, this connects to a database to do the query. And the database is an external system. We use a library to help us interact with um, our database. And this library um, expects there to be a running database in place, which can either be running um, a DynamoDB in an instance of AWS, or else you can run DynamoDB locally, and you can configure your config to look on localhost and find the database there. When I'm running my unit tests, I don't actually want to connect to a real AWS instance, and nor do I want to have to orchestrate bringing up a local instance of Dynamo, creating a table, populating that data for the test, and then tearing it all down once my unit test is finished. So basically, in terms of dependency inversion, I don't want my high-level module, which is my get customer preferences module, to depend on the details of this library. Instead, I want to separate those layers and give myself the ability to plug in a fake database so that when I run my unit tests, I don't have to connect to any running database at all. If you recall, in Elixir, we can configure um, different implementations in different environments. So if I can isolate the code that connects to the database, I could um, put different implementations in, whether I'm in prod or in test. So looking at the code, there's actually only one line which physically will connect to DynamoDB. So I'm going to extract that out and then work out a way where I can either plug it back in for production or use a fake implementation for my other environments. So Elixir gives you a couple of ways that you can achieve this. And one way is to um, use the config to substitute in and out at runtime. So in terms of our design for dependency inversion, I want to have different implementations of the database. So I have the real database, and then I have a fake database. And I want them to um, adhere to a contract, an abstraction, which we'll use a behavior for again. Then I have my high-level module, which is the get customer preferences. And I want that to use the behavior. So it's unaware whether or not I'm connecting to the real database underneath or whether I'm just using a fake database. So I create my behavior, which is my abstraction. I want to wrap the library call into a module which implements that behavior. And then I want to provide a fake database. It's going to be another module which implements the same behavior. But when I call the request, I'm just going to return a canned result in the same format as what the real database would be returning. Then in my config files, I'm going to state that I want to use the fake database in my test environment and my real database in my prod environment. That's what you configure. And then at runtime, you can look up, and it will inject in the configured implementation. So that's great. That actually helps. I can, um, in my test environment, get my canned result back. And that's fine if I just have one test but I want to test some of the edge cases. I want to test what happens when I hit the database and there's no result found, and that there's multiple results found, and that an exception is thrown. And at the moment, it's always just returning the same canned result. 
So I can build some logic into my fake, but the only way I can drive the logic is from the input into the function. And in this case, it's the customer ID. So I could update my fake to say something like, if the customer ID is one, then return the canned result. If customer ID is two, return an empty result. If it's three, throw an exception, and so on. But it's quite tricky to keep that expressive through the code base. And from looking at a unit test, I might not know which branch of that fake is going to be executed. And over time, that fake might be quite complex, and I might not know which branches are actually ever executed. And then do I start unit testing my fakes? And the complexity can grow. So whilst using config files gives you quite a bit of flexibility, if you have a rich set of test scenarios, you might find that your fakes become quite complex in themselves. So another option you could think about is using a mocking library. And um, one of the ones I've used is called mocks. And that way, you're able to define the behavior of your, your mock right there in the unit test where perhaps it's most relevant. So to use mocks as a dependency, you just add it to your mixed dependency file. And we'll keep our same design for dependency inversion. But we don't actually need to create the fake database ourselves. We can get mocks to do that for us. So we can actually remove the fake database from the picture. We still need to wrap our real database call adhering to the behavior that we defined. We still want to configure that in our prod config so that at runtime of its production, it will use the real database. But in our test config, we'll declare that we want to use a mock request. And this can actually have any name you like because we're going to get mocks to create it for us. And we do that in our test helper. We can say, mocks, please create me a module called mock request, which implements the database request behavior. At runtime, we'll look up which implementation we want to use. So it will work for prod and in test using the fake one. And in our unit tests, we declare that we want to use the mock request, which mocks has created. And then we provide our expectation. So here we're saying when that fake that mocks has created is hit and the request function is invoked, then return a tuple containing an OK status and a canned result, which we've declared elsewhere in that file. If you forget to provide the expectation, you will get an exception. And that's good feedback. And, and I've also found that it's helped me understand how many layers through the code my tests are actually running. Because sometimes you don't realize you're going to hit the database because your, your mind's testing something else. But then you'll get an exception like this, which reminds you, oh, yes, this flow is indeed going to hit the database. So there's definitely similarities between creating your own config and your own uh, fakes and using something like mocks to help you. But I think one of the main advantages of using the mocking library is that you define the return behavior right there in your test. So as a developer, when you're looking through the test cases, it's much clearer um, and what's going to happen when these dependencies are hit. And you don't need to go to a fake file somewhere else on your file tree and try and figure out which branch of that fake is going to be executed. The only slight untidy edge is that mox, uh, mix will spit out a warning because you're referring to a module which doesn't physically exist on your file tree uh, because mox has created that on the fly for you. Um, but I think the advantages outweigh that. So in terms of dependency inversion, having separated our high-level modules from our, the detail of our low-level modules, we've been able to swap in and out different implementations, which has provided greater flexibility for testing. So can you write solid Elixir? Well, we just did. We've applied every single solid principle to our Elixir code base. And it's all still running fine. I think the real question is, is this idiomatic Elixir? Or have we just ended up with a functional code base which resembles something like Java code? You know, are these rules the right rules to be applying to our functional landscape? I mean, the characteristics of an object-oriented programming language are different to that of functional. But, um, amongst other things, in functional, you tend to be passing data around most of the time, whereas in OO, you're reacting to messages that are being sent between different objects. So I think the solid principles definitely get you started. Um, but we might need to adapt some of them slightly to align with the traits of the functional programming languages. 
with maintainability in mind, um, it seems beneficial um, to adhere to the single responsibility principle. Having small focused functions is as good in Elixir as it is in any programming language, OO or functional. Functions are the building blocks of a functional language, so having small functions will lead to more potential reuse if you're currying them together, um, passing them in and out. So from my point of view, S is fully implementable in uh, functional language. Regarding open close, it seems low risk to be able to add to your code base without touching any existing code, because this will reduce any retesting effort. In Elixir, we have higher order functions, so we can pass functions into other functions. So you could argue that in functional languages, it's actually easier to adhere to the open close principle, because you can just pass a new function in to some existing code without touching it. So I think open close is a good goal to strive for. What about list cost substitution? We saw how in the OO world, this tends to leverage the inheritance model, which we don't really use much in the functional world. So perhaps this is one we should redefine slightly. One of the things functional programmers uh, strive for is purity. And pure functions are deterministic. They have an input and an output. And given the same input, they will always give back the same output without any other side effects. So we have a pure function here, which simply adds two numbers together. We can use this in a function called lucky number and we can derive what the output of lucky number will be. And in this case, the output is always going to be the number seven. So if I went through the code base and replaced every time I'd called lucky number with the value seven, my program should still run exactly as it was, because the result of the evaluating expression is going to have the same mathematical value as the starting code. And this is known as referential transparency. So I would propose we modify the definition of list cost substitution and instead replace it with referential transparency as a substitution model. And that will be more in line with the functional characteristics. In OO programming, we saw that the interface segregation was about keeping your um, interfaces small and concise. And we did the same with our behaviors. And in the Elixir documentation, it actually states that if you have to, you can think of a behavior as being similar to a Java interface. So I think that backs up my point that we should be applying the interface, interface segregation principle to our Elixir behaviors. And then we saw D. Um, and we saw how creating an abstraction between our high-level layers and our low-level layers allowed us to swap in and out different implementations. And that particularly helped when testing with external systems. Um, so, at a future date, perhaps we need to work in some of these other traits. Functional languages are immutable. Functional languages tend to favor recursion over imperative looping. And in Elixir, we have pattern matching. So over time, we can build some of these things into some more principles that are relevant for our functional world. So coming back to the title of the talk, um, many of those who consider themselves a functional programmer tend to brush aside the learnings from the OO community. So by going to the extreme and actually forcing these OO principles on my Elixir code base, I actually found many of them made sense. And the result was more concise, more focused code that was easier to test. And regardless of what we consider to be idiomatic code, um, we can probably all agree that we should be writing code that's easy to update and easy to uh, maintain over time. So single responsibility is definitely applicable in the functional world. O for open close is a good goal to strive for. We replaced L with RT for referential transparency to acknowledge the purity of the language. We can apply the integrated segregation principle to our Elixir behaviors and we can use dependency injection to help with our testing. So perhaps the baseline for the design principles in Elixir could be sorted. Thank you very much. <laughs>